Hi, welcome. You're at Jimby Live. Jimby is Journal of Microbiology and Biology Education. And we host this webinar series approximately monthly to encourage um, broader knowledge about the journal and readership. This is an open access journal, meaning that anybody um, has the opportunity to access the content. And today we're very delighted to host a discussion with some senior editors. Um, we have Samantha Parks. She's the senior editor of the research article section. And we have Jeffrey Olimpo, who's a senior editor of Tips and Tools. And they're going to be engaging in a discussion about um, the sections and how they might differ from each other. And we're going to have um, a discussion with the editor-in-chief, Stanley Malloy, uh, um, to go along with it. So a few housekeeping items. Do note that we are recording today's webinar and we're gonna post it onto Jimby's YouTube playlist. And I'll post the link of where you'll be able to find the recording next week. And then you can also go back and view the library of all of our recordings. We probably have a nice library of about 25 to 30 recordings now. And they're all authors that have given talks about their research or curriculum or tips and tools articles. So check it out when you can. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our Editor-in-Chief of Jimby, Stan Malloy. Thanks very much, Rachel. Before we kick in, I just want to give a little bit more background to Jimby. Um, so Jimby has the word microbiology and biology in the title, but in reality, we publish a lot of articles that include different areas that are really important for teaching science. So for example, papers that relate to math skills and writing skills that are so critical for the people to learn and implement science. And the other thing is that we publish in for the whole range of education, from K through 12 education to undergraduate and graduate education at colleges and universities, on through informal education. And a core reason for that is that science can have an impact by training future scientists, but we can also have a real important impact by building scientific literacy so that you need those kids coming through K through 12 and informal education to really be robust. But we've been doing a lot of things the same way we've done them for years and years. So Jimby's about how can we do it differently? How can we improve? How can we actually use data about how, how effective education is to change our practices? And the journal's broken into several sections. So there's a section on research that Sam will talk about today. There's a section on perspectives, on curriculum, on tips and tools that Jeff will talk about today. And then every year we have an annual issue that's focused on some very special timely topic. This year, that topic will be scientific literacy. And I wanna reiterate what Rachel said. Jimby is an open access journal. So you can read all of the content for free from our website. And our editors are all people who are actively doing research in education. And they really want to see good research, good ideas, good concepts in education, make it to publication so that they can influence all of us, make us all better at teaching and improve learning for students at any level, wherever they are. So we're going to start today with a discussion with Jeffrey Olimpo from the Tips and Tools section. He's the senior editor of that section. And Jeff is the director of the Center for Faculty Leadership and Development and an associate professor of biological sciences at the University of Texas, El Paso. Very importantly, Jeff was just honored as a AAAS fellow, a really wonderful honor that reflects his impact uh, in this field. He's an active discipline-based education research or deeper uh, scientist, and he focuses on active learning, on student motivation, identification as a scientist, and many other interrelated areas. So Jeff, over to you. Thanks so much, Stan. Let me go ahead and load my slides and try not to break technology this morning or afternoon, depending upon your time zone. All right, let me 
hopefully you can see my screen. Uh, if you can and something looks weird, please just give a shout out and I can work on fixing that. So again, good morning or afternoon to everyone, depending upon where you're, you're joining us from. Uh, as Stan mentioned in that really kind introduction, my name is Jeff Olimpo and I am on the faculty in the biology department at the University of Texas at El Paso. And I just wanna take a few moments to provide an overview of the section that I serve as senior editor for, which is tips and tools, and to provide some kind of ins and outs and recommendations for those of you who may be interested in submitting to this section. So as you consider tips and tools among the other sections that are available in the journal, one of the benefits to the tips and tools section <clears throat> excuse me, one of the benefits to the tips and tools section is that the type of manuscript that you submit can be incredibly wide reaching. And by that, I mean, if you have some kind of brief novel idea in any realm of thinking about biology, teaching and learning, uh, particularly at the post-secondary level, but as Stan mentioned, really across the gamut from K-16 education all the way through informal education, in graduate education, the tips and tools section is an ideal space for you, right? This is the place that the readers would look to to gain some immediate kind of teaching tips to fill their tool bag, right? As they enter into the classroom, perhaps for a new semester. The other thing that I would argue that folks tend to forget, which is why I've included it here, is that we also welcome new spins on old ideas. So for example, if you've seen a paper published using a tool around science literacy as an example to follow off of Stan's point, but you've tweaked it, you've modified it, you've adapted and implemented it in new ways, we still welcome submissions of that variety. So it doesn't need to be a 100% kind of brand spanking new idea that you've come up with. It can be a modification to an existing tool that really importantly would benefit a lot of other educators if you shared out through a venue like Jimby. The other thing that I'll mention is that most of our articles, at least the ones that I see come in, are focused on undergraduate education, are focused on the student, and that's perhaps not surprising, but we also welcome articles that are instead focused more so on educators and scholars. So if you've designed, for example, an innovative tool to use with teaching assistants uh, in a program that you facilitate, or you've done something with faculty, those types of submissions and those topics are also incredibly welcome, not only for the tips and tools section, but across the journal as well. One of the other major benefits is that no data, no assessment or evaluation data are required in order to publish in the tips and tools section. We welcome those data if you have access to it and you have IRB approval to collect those data. But if you said, oh, you know, I tried something out, I really wanna get it out there and see what other people think, uh, or build some kind of capacity around an idea that I have, but oh darn, I you know I didn't have pre-post data or I didn't ask people for feedback about X, that's completely okay, right, for this particular section. So I put that again, kind of blatantly and transparently out there to provide encouragement for folks who otherwise may feel like, oh, I'm not ready to submit. Well, that may not actually be the case, right? If you have a well-formed idea and you field tested, you've kind of vetted the idea even if you are quote unquote lacking, right? True assessment or evaluation metrics, totally okay. Um, and if you have concerns, of course, that's a time to reach out to me. I'll share my contact information at the end. Lastly, just to echo Rachel's point and Stan's point, Jimby is an open access indexed and peer reviewed journal. So it is going out to an incredibly wide readership. It speaks, I think, both to practitioners, educators, as well as scholars in the area of discipline-based education research or in teaching and learning. So if you're looking to cast your net particularly wide, I think Jimby is an excellent place to publish your work. In considering the structure of tips and tools manuscripts, here are a few things that you wanna keep in mind. You're gonna have kind of a standard cover page. That's your title, your author information, information about numbers of figures and supplemental materials, et cetera a short abstract of about 250 words. And then as you can see here, the structure of tips and tools, as you might expect, looks a bit different than, for instance, the research articles that Sam is gonna talk about. So you still have to have an introduction that should contain, in essence, some degree of a literature review to support right, the ideas that you're putting forth and that you would like to convey to the audience. The procedure section, 
Uh, it has a really interesting name because I think we see procedure and we're like methods, right? We think about listing things in a scientific protocol, but the procedure here is really the nuts and bolts of what you did. So describe your activity. Tell me how you're going to implement it. Tell us if there's any specific things that each student should know or that faculty should know as they get ready to implement or engage in this type of activity. If it's a laboratory activity, you also want to be explicit about any safety concerns, and I would refer you back to ASM's guidelines for safety in laboratory contexts. The conclusion section can include can again vary widely, and by that I mean this may be a place to put data if you've collected data that you wish to share. This could be to some degree anecdotal feedback, right? You talk to so and so about this, or in passing, you spoke with students and they were really excited about the activity that you. Uh, put forth in the classroom that you're reporting out on, and then perhaps not shockingly references at the end. These articles, as I'll reinforce throughout, are short. They're 800 to 1100 word manuscripts. Um, and so, right, this is a space to really shine a spotlight on the thing that you've done. And it may very well preface submission of a manuscript to a different section, right? So maybe you have a full-blown study that's really appropriate for Sam's research section, but you also have this one aspect that's really kind of cool and intriguing and novel, and you want to publish that as a tips and tools piece. Okay, so publishing a tips and tools doesn't preclude you from kind of thinking more expansively also and submitting to other sections of the journal. In addition, within the tips and tools article, figures and tables are welcome. I get the question sometimes about, oh, does it need to be all text? Can I include graphics? Absolutely, right? Those figures and tables can be data tables. But if visuals are also really pertinent to conveying the idea that you want to convey, certainly, right? Please include those as well to increase clarity and readability. Those things are not required, however, which again ties back to the notion of thinking about the fact that evaluation and assessment metrics are not an absolute for this tips and tools section. The other question I often get asked is what about supplemental materials? So my word of advice here is make use of supplementary materials. There's no added cost to publish those supplemental materials. Avoid dumping excess text into that. So for instance, don't try to cheat the 800 to 1100 word limit by creating a supplemental file that's 30 pages long. Um, but if you do, again, have reservations or concerns about the balance between each of those parts, that's a question for me. I'm happy to address that and kind of work through that. Here are some examples of things that can go in there. Handouts, any specific instructions, right? So again, maybe it's a handout for a teaching assistant. Hey, if we're gonna implement this lab exercise, here's kind of the ins and outs to doing that effectively. So vis-a-vis -vis some form of training or professional development. You can include data in this section. So if you have you know, a huge number of quotes that you wanna put forth, or whatever it may end up being, and you include just some in the body of the manuscript, you may include others in the supplemental materials. Please make sure if you do include data that you have appropriate IRB permission to do so. Um, so it's clear to your IRB, your institutional review board office, you have approval to have collected and disseminate human subjects research data. And I believe Rachel is gonna share a link. I think there's a link to that. Don't quote me, I don't know if I've had enough coffee yet, but. I think that's up somewhere. Um, so please be sure that you have that in place too, because that's often a concern, right? People include data without any indication of having received institutional review board permission to do so. What you shouldn't include, this is probably pretty self-explanatory, but please be aware to not include anything that's currently under copyright. Uh, if you would like to include images from publications that you've authored, in subsequent publications, permission is needed to reproduce those images. Um, but please keep that in mind. If it is going to increase, increase clarity and readability, should not be an issue, but we need clearance to do that if it's under copyright. Remember that these tips and tools articles are designed to be picked up and adapted by faculty nationwide and internationally. And so to the best as you can, the best of your ability, avoid making specific reference to your own course program or institution. Now, that doesn't mean you can't talk about, right, we're at a research intensive institution, so implementing X may be easier because we have these resources, but if you were going to adapt it to dot, 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 right? So you can still talk in language like that, but you'll want to avoid things like, we implemented this in biology 1107, right? 
uh, because nobody's going to really have a true understanding of what that means. Instead, say something like, this was implemented in an introductory biology laboratory course for majors, right? I just mentioned this, but you absolutely have to have IRB permission in order to share any kind of human subjects data. So if you do not, right, you're thinking about collecting data in the future, you can't retroactively ask for permission, right? So if you've collected a bunch of data, you've included it, but we flagged it as an issue with IRB. You can't secretly go in the Wayback Time Machine and try to get permission from those students or submit through IRB. So be mindful of that. But again, Tips and Tools does not require data in order for your manuscripts to be published, the articles to be published. But just something to keep in mind. And then also always double check the author guidelines. So for example, um, not frequently, but occasionally we receive articles that are much more science focused and science education focused. ASM has a lot of other wonderful venues to publish the science kind of content, the disciplinary content pieces, but that's outside the scope of GIMB. So be sure to double check the author guidelines as you're planning to prepare your manuscript and ultimately submit your manuscript. The acceptance rate, and these data have changed. This is, I think, from a year ago. So I'm sure this has shifted. Acceptance rates uh, historically have approached 80%. Uh, Jimby across the board really has, I think, a very strong tradition of working with potential authors or prospective authors. Uh, I envision this as a learning process. So our goal is not to see your manuscript and immediately hit the reject button and be completely demoralizing, right? But really to have a conversation with you as a prospective author uh, about things we see, about areas you may really wanna highlight in your articles and so on and so forth. So the relatively high, I would say acceptance rate in this section is partly also because this is a nice entry point into the journal to share your thoughts, your resources, the tips and techniques you've developed, but it's also bolstered by across the board, really the editorial board's commitment to viewing this as a learning process and helping you grow as education researchers and as writers, right, of education research. A few final thoughts before I share my own contact information. Again, make sure that you double check that your manuscript adheres to all author guidelines. We'll flag and reach out to you if that's not the case. I always like to have somebody with a clean set of eyes read. At some point, your eyes glaze over, right? And you start missing things. And so if possible, we encourage folks to have a third party read through their manuscript, keeping in mind that if your manuscript is published, it's gonna be read by an incredibly broad audience across lots of different subdisciplines in biology and potentially, obviously also other STEM fields. Don't be discouraged if we ask for revisions. 99.999% of the manuscripts that come in, right, will have some form of revisions required. These may be smaller, these may be, you know, more major revisions, but that's okay. That's part and parcel of the process. And once again, if you're confused or you have questions about any aspect uh, of the feedback that we provide to you and the reviews that you get, you can always reach out to us for clarification. There it is, right? If you have any questions or concerns, give us a holler. We're here to be supportive and to help. Um, don't be discouraged. For instance, for me, if it piles up in my inbox, just keep giving me a gentle nudge. We wanna make sure that we're here to support you in your writing efforts around the cool and innovative things that you're doing. And I will just leave you with this. There's my kind of direct line, if you will, jtolimpo at utep.edu. So if at any time you do have questions or concerns, either about the tips and tools section or about a manuscript that you're currently preparing, I would encourage you, strongly encourage you to reach out and we can work through those one-on-one. -on -one. And thank you for your time. And I will stop sharing my screen and transition it back to Stan. Thanks very much, Jeff. I, I just wanna make one comment to something Jeff said, and that is if you are coming from another country, I see we have some people from other countries who are listening in. Uh, the human subjects approvals, it may not be called an IRB. In the United States, it's called an Institutional Review Board, but it, it has a different name in Canada and a different name elsewhere. The important point is that you go through that approval process and um, it's a robust and rigorous approval process for use of human subjects data. Right? The next speaker is gonna be Samantha Parks. She's editor of the research section. Sam is a senior lecturer at Georgia State University. She's very active in 
discipline-based education research. And her focus has been on student learning, on science literacy, on STEM identity. And in particular, she's really worked in bringing education and microbial ecology together. So she's developed a, a CURE, a course-based undergraduate research experience focused on microbial ecology. And she's also, because of that experience, uh, really focused on the evaluation of effectiveness of cures and on online learning. Sam, over to you. Thank you so much, Stan. And I'm really happy to share ideas related to the research section with all of you. Um, and then to continue this conversation, um, and I'll give you my email address so that we continue beyond this um, webinar. So let me go ahead and start sharing, except not letting me start. See, Jeff, it wasn't just you. I can't be easily to start it. So give me one moment. I also do not want to break any type of technology. So I'm giving you my email address on this first slide here. I'll give it to you again. Um, again, I am Samantha Parks from Georgia State University with a focus on microbial ecology, but also on Deaver as well. And before I dive in, um, we have a really large group of research editors. Um, I have another senior editor that I work with, Loretta. And if you go on to Jim B's main page, you can reach out to any of us with any questions. So all of our emails are on the main Jim B editor page. And I just wanted to open up that conversation if you have any questions going forward. When you are considering a research article, there are a few kind of key ways to define these. And the first is that we are looking for novel hypothesis-driven scholarship. As Jeff mentioned, this should be related to science education, teaching, learning. And there are lots of different ways that you can approach research. So you might be evaluating evidence-based learning activities or a new curriculum, new courses. You may be assessing student learning and engagement. This may be in the short term or more long term with retention. Um, you may be validating different types of programs. Regardless of which type of study you're focusing on, each needs to have a novel hypothesis and really come with your interpretation of the data. Over the general criteria, this is a much larger manuscript. Um, our typical research articles are in the 3,000 to 4,000 range, but they can vary um, between 1,500 and 4,000. This would include your abstract, but not your citations. We're definitely looking for a logical flow. What is the background in your introduction? Where does your work fit in the context of the literature? What was your research question? And what were you seeking to test? And then we're looking for systematic data collection, assessment, and your interpretation. Some key things that we look for are how are you doing your data collection? Have you described this adequately in methods such that your data um, or your experiment rather, are, it's repeatable? Um, and this is a great place to bring up if you are looking at those supplements as Jeff brought up, if you are using surveys, you might put survey questions in your supplement and only have an example in your method section. And that's a really great way to use a supplement for a research article. We also look at what types of statistics are you using? How are you assessing um, your data? And is it appropriate given what you are trying to do research to understand? Did you use the correct tools and did you interpret them in a correct manner? And I do wanna bring up IRB as this can be a little bit of a confusing point. And one of the reasons that IRB might be confusing is it does vary from institution to institution, as Stan mentioned, from country to country. The idea is that if you are working with students and working with student data, it's always best to ask whatever IRB office or research office you have on your campus. Some of these studies might be considered what are known as exempt, but you still go through part of the IRB process. They may be expedited or you may require a full IRB approval. 
most of our research articles will require IRB approval. Um, most of them, you will just list this out, um, usually in your method section and kind of explain that you did seek IRB approval and then you would give that number as needed. Again, you need to place your research in context with the scientific literature. And this is important for both anchoring it and demonstrating how your study is novel, how it adds to the field and deepens the field. Hypotheses should be rigorous and testable. One of the biggest concerns that I see with research articles is that reviewers cannot identify the hypothesis or they read a hypothesis and it does not seem novel. And so usually that's kind of the first point when we're looking at these manuscripts where reviewers might show some concern and ask for more information. Assessment strategies must be aligned with those hypotheses so that you have your story and your testing as you move forward through your research. You need to make sure that you have appropriate controls and appropriate statistical tools are used that your conclusions are supported by the data, and finally, again, that you are showing advancement of the field. So you should know what to include and where, right? So similar to Tips and Tools article, we have a brief abstract, um, which does give an anchoring for the entire paper. Your introduction should include a literature review. This is where a lot of those citations will come into play. Clear research question, Clear rationale for your research. And this is where you can bring to the manuscript how you view your novel research. Why is it so important to study and to publish this work? And there needs to be, again, a clear statement of hypothesis. Your methods should include who was involved in the study. Who are the participants? And importantly, how are they selected? This can be also where you include your IRB approval or you can um, include it towards the end of methods in a separate section. Which types of methods, which surveys, which questions, were you using um, regular in-course tests? Were you getting feedback from students? Were you doing conversations to get feedback? How were you scoring surveys or conversation? All of these materials go into the method section, including your statistics. The results should be text organized with tables and figures where appropriate. As tables and figures help to organize the material into a meaningful way, they're really important in the results section. In fact, a lot of papers that come through, reviewers will actually ask for clarity with the text. And I've even seen suggestions from reviewers for how to organize text into a table to make it more readable and more user-friendly for the Jimby readership. The results should follow a logical flow as well. And if you want to include samples of work or comments from surveys, that is of course um, welcome in the results section, but some of that would also go into a supplement as needed. The discussion and conclusion is truly a summary of your findings. You're placing your body of work into this greater context of educational research. And you're explaining how you're broadening the field and kind of where this can go going further. You would include explanations, mechanisms behind your findings. And then it's also really important to include any possible limitations. If you are conducting a study um, during kind of a lockdown pandemic scenario, and now you're starting to open back up with hybrid and in-person learning, this may change how your study moves forward. And you can explain that. If you had a smaller cohort of students one semester, this can be further explained in a manuscript. And it's really a clear place to put this into discussion so that our readership can evaluate the work in the greater body of literature. Of course, you want to include acknowledgements and references as well. In order to keep under that 4,000 word limit, which at times can be very difficult for a research article. It's really important to keep that supplementary information um, in mind. So raw data, surveys, rubrics, all of those can go into your supplement. And then to echo what Jeff mentioned, copyrighted information, information that was previously published, images without permission or citation, um, all of those need to be left out of the research manuscript. And then, if you have specific program information, 
if you are sharing a survey, you would remove your institution's name if you have the course number for the students that you gave the survey to or the due date, all of that should be removed from that information. Now, we do not have the same um, submission outcomes as tips and tools, but you can see that we do publish a large percentage of our submissions. It's really a, a low percentage of publishing without revision. And I wanna start the conversation here and then I'll reiterate it um, in a slide or so. Revision is normal. It is absolutely normal to have revisions requested. So don't be discouraged. If you submit a research manuscript and you get it returned with a full list of ideas for you to think about and reflect and revise, that's a normal part of the writing process. And I agree with Jeff, we're really trying to work with authors to help improve the writing and we will help get you to that publication wherever we can. So if you look, about a third of our papers are published after initial revision. About a third of our submissions, we will request that you resubmit it for review, meaning there's more substantial revision needed. Only about 15% are declined without peer review. Um, we get a few more uh, papers that are really outside of the realm of science education, and um, maybe something more focused on the science or genetics or microbiology, the things that are really outside of the scope of the journal. Um, and then about 20, 25% are going to get declined after peer review, meaning that after review by three independent reviewers, um, an editor sends back a decision that this is really not suited for the journal as currently written. Some common issues that we see beyond what we've already discussed is number one, author guidelines not followed. And so I believe Rachel has shared links to those guidelines and I have a link that'll come through on these slides when they're posted. Whichever section you are choosing to submit to, I really encourage you to read through those author guidelines and follow them. That's our number one kind of stumbling area for initial submissions and lack of proofreading. So if you're referencing table numbers that tables aren't there anymore, that type of proofreading can really confuse a submission. The background can also be a concern. You're using that literature review and that background information to put your story, to put your research into the greater context. And if it's not complete, if it's inappropriately cited, that's really going to be an area where reviewers get concerned. Um, and reviewers tend to be really helpful. Well, they will provide links to other manuscripts that you might want to consider or other bodies of work to try and get you to pull in that background information in a meaningful manner. Also, an unclear research question or hypothesis can make it very difficult to follow an article and follow the meaning behind the research. Methodology, if that's a concern, usually has to do with a lack of procedural detail um, or that the type of statistics or assessment um, of the data does not seem to align well with the results. Occasionally, we'll also see issues where reviewers will evaluate the data and come to a very different conclusion. And so that might start a conversation um, of how this conclusion was derived. And so my final thoughts to you are to start your writing process with a clear logical flow. Consider what you have implemented, how it's been assessed, what the data is interpreting, uh, what you're interpreting the data as saying, and then put that into a greater context. Don't be discouraged if revisions are requested. Um, just thoughtfully consider and respond to the reviewer and editor comments and questions. And if you receive a decision and you don't know how to respond to those revisions or concerns, reach out to your editor or senior editor and just ask. You know, you can say, I don't really understand what is being asked of me. Can you help clarify? Can you help bring, you know, some meaning to this idea so that I can better revise? And I'll put in a plug that maybe you want to try to become a reviewer for Jimby. 
I started as a reviewer for tips and tools and research articles. And it was fantastic because I was able to see what types of articles would go through the review process in a more favorable manner. What issues were more common and popped up that needed revision? And I think that it made me a stronger writer. So a really not so mild plug to um, have you look into reviewing for Jimby. You get a greater understanding of the overall process. And so with that, I'm going to end. I will stop sharing. And I think that we will open up to questions. I will turn it back over to Stan while I put my email in the chat for everyone. So, so I'd like to follow up on, on a couple things uh, that Sam said. Uh, one of them is that if you're interested in being a reviewer, sometime in the time frame of the next month to two, we will have an open call for reviewers. And so you might keep your eye out for that. And that's a, a great way to, you know, put your name in the, the bag to uh, try to determine whether you whether it's the right time to be a reviewer. So that's gonna happen soon, uh, keep your eye open for it. The other thing is I'd really like to emphasize the concept of a manuscript being declined without peer review, right? As Sam said, sometimes we'll get a manuscript that's more appropriate for one of the other ASM journals than it is for Jimby. It, it, it's not really directly related to education and so, if you have a question, if your manuscript's appropriate or not, you can ask that question to us and we'll give you an answer before you ever submit it, right? So it might save you a little time and effort and, and speed the process to getting to the right place, right? Now, uh, one of our viewers asked the question, what should we do if an instructor doesn't have the funds for page charges? So ASM will grant full or partial waivers in cases of genuine need. And, and in particular, fee waivers are con considered for corresponding authors who are from a community college or a minority serving institution that may not have a lot of funds from an under-resourced country as defined by the World Bank list of low-income economies people who are in a temporary position, for example, a graduate student or postdoctoral fellow or, or an adjunct, and people who are at a very early stage of their careers. That is, people who have, are within five years of completing their training, right? So if you think you're in one of these categories and you'd like to get a fee waiver, uh, just let us know and, and we will consider that, that fee waiver uh, as we look at your credentials, okay? But but, but be sure to ask. Don't let that prevent you from submitting something that you think uh, would be a very good manuscript. I might just add one more thing. And having been an administrator for many years, if sometimes, although you, you don't know you can do this, if you go ask your dean if they could give you a little resources to publish this paper, sometimes the dean will be happy to help promote your career and enhance uh, the institution. So. You should not ignore that possibility if, if that exists. So um, I want to now just open this up. Um, so maybe Jeff, you could comment on some of the things Sam said uh, about the difference between research articles versus tips and tools articles. And if you'd like to add anything addition to what you said already. Sure. I have to apologize, though. Uh, the fire alarm went off in my building, and so I was running around the hallway with my laptop um, <laughs> because it's a Friday, and why not, right? Woohoo, it's the weekend. Um, so I would just say, in thinking about the comparison between tips and tools and the research section, the largest kind of difference in my mind's eye is the level of data collection and the the framing of the article. So again, for tips and tools, there's no qualms, right? There's no issues with submitting data, but that level of data is often significantly, it should be, right? Significantly less than what the expectation for a research article would be. My general thought process behind this is where did you start, right? So if you started with a list of research questions, and, you know, developed hypotheses around those questions, et cetera, it's very likely 
that you're pursuing an article that would fall under Sam's purview. If you were just thinking, hey, I really want to share this awesome, innovative thing that I've done, it's a cool activity for the classroom, chances are you're looking either more towards the tips and tools section that I help kind of co-coordinate or a curriculum article. Um, and the difference there can be very subtle. To me, it also has one to do a bit with data. The curriculum space is also much more structured to be expansive about instructions for students and instructions for authors. Uh, so it really depends on scale, right? Um, what I, again, want to impress that I tried to mention is that there's no shame in the game for lack of a better way of putting it, right? So I only publish in tips and tools or it ended up in, re right? So there, there's no lesser than kind of deficit framing around this. And you can build, and I don't know if, if this, Stan, you can probably answer this, of course, much better than I. It used to be the case, at least when I asked, that you could publish um, two kind of connected pieces in the same issue. So if you had a full-blown research article and you also had a small-scale tips and tools piece and they partnered right well together because they were about the same overarching program, for example, you could submit them and have them actually aligned to be published in the same issue so people saw both, right, and could more easily connect those dots. I would just echo Sam and Stan's point and Rachel's point early on, which is to just reach out to us. So if you have an idea and you're really not quite sure which direction is the most appropriate to pursue, give us a holler. Do that early. Um, I think frustration crops up. When the, when ping ponging happens later in the process, you've submitted, for instance, to tips and tools, and we say, uh huh, no, that really belongs here. And then that delays things further along, right? Which admittedly can cause some frustration. So early in the process, I would really strongly encourage you to reach out uh, and we can kind of appropriately direct you towards the section that would likely be the best fit. But those are the big things for me, Sam. I don't know if you see other things that come through that are, again, beyond the list that you kind of provided, but things that are really distinguished features of research can, that wouldn't necessarily be the case for something like a tips and tools article. Jeff, let me just add something. That is, if you are going to submit two simultaneously, the, the cover letter that you send in should explicitly say something about that, right? So the cover letter really matters. It, it can help the senior editor figure out who are the best editors for your manuscript. Uh, it can help the editor understand really the context in which you're submitting a manuscript and maybe better be able to help you. And in a case like this, it will make it seem like it's not just trying to publish the same thing twice. It will be more clear why you want to do a tips and tools and a research article together. Yeah, say something in the, the submission editor, the, the cover letter that you send in. Sorry, Sam, I had to plug that before going on to you. <laughs> no, and I, I thank you for doing that. I So I have seen a lot of research papers where they reference an activity or an intervention that has come through maybe tips and tools um, or even potentially curriculum where the idea or the activity or the framework is published elsewhere. And then the analysis of it is published in a research article. So I think publishing both together is a fantastic um, idea. I've also seen a lot where it's pre-published, you know, the curriculum piece or the tips and tools piece comes earlier and then they reference, authors do a really successful job referencing that in their research article. So I think the biggest difference is really how the intent for capturing the data and how the data is analyzed, that's really the difference for me between a research article and some of those others. Um, one of the people in the audience asked the question about formatting. The comment is that formatting can be very tedious and it would be nice not to have to be buried in that tedium. I, I think everyone who submits papers to multiple journals understands this, right? So ASM converted well, a, a couple of years ago or so to a, a format neutral process. So you can submit your paper in, in whatever format you have it in, as long as you have all the required sections. Um, and 
it's okay. We'll review it in that format. Before it has to be published, it needs to, so if your paper's accepted, then it's gonna need to be converted to the proper format. But what that means is that where you're in the process of just getting things in, getting them off your desk and getting them submitted, um, you don't have to worry so much about the format. If you've submitted your paper to science or nature and, and from there you decide, oh, Jimby would be a better place, we'll, we'll take it in that science or nature format and go from there, okay? So, so don't let that stop you. Uh, I also just reiterate again, is that the editors really try to help you. So if they see something where formatting is a real problem because it affects the understanding of the paper, they will really let you know about that. Um, the, one of the other really big issues here has to do with IRB approval. And for some people, it may not be obvious you know, when you might need IRB approval. I wonder if, if the two of you could say something more about that. Absolutely. And I, I will share that the first time that I sought out IRB approval was in response to a biology scholars program um, through ASM. And I quickly realized that each institution has very different guidelines um, for IRB approval. I think as soon as you start to consider using student data, whether it is assessment data or survey data or discussion, working with any people, and as a microbial ecologist, that was very difficult for me to make that transition. Um, that's when you immediately go to your IRB at your institution. And in my experience, regardless of institution, those people are experts in the wording and the requirements for your institution. Um, whether a study is considered exempt and it's almost like you're notifying IRB what's happening, or if you need some level of you know, full approval, your institution will help guide you along that path. Um, I know different institutions even have different verbiage that they would send out to authors. So if you are considering a survey for data collection, um, any type of in-person meetings, um, if you are gathering student data to evaluate the effectiveness of an intervention, any of that would require IRB approval. Um, and I would just start that conversation early. So, so Sam, why is that important? Well, why do we care? We're trying to protect our subjects. We're trying to protect their data. We're trying to make sure that a student or any other individual does not feel compelled in a negative way to share their data. We don't want students to wonder, well, where is my test grade going? Who's going to see it? So when you're doing your IRB approval, you're gonna find out that you have to store data in a secure manner. You have to do informed consent where you explain in language that your st students or subjects can understand how they're being assessed, what is required of them, that they're absolutely free to leave the study at any time without any detriment. And it's really a, a good way to communicate about that research to protect students, educators, whoever your subject may be. Yeah. Thank, thanks very much. Yeah. And, and I think that one of the key things there is you don't want somebody to be able to get into your data that you've published and figure out, oh, you know, Stanley Malloy got a D in that class, <laughs> right? And so our, our, I'm, it could be something more consequential than that. But, but fundamentally, I, I think that it, it is a really important thing. We're protecting people. We're not adding bureaucracy. We're doing something meaningful here. So, um, so Jeff, in, in terms of tips and tools to give a nice overview of things, why don't you give us a, an example of what you think might be a, a really nice tips and tools article, so something a little more concrete. Sure. So in reviewing articles through tips and tools, we actually see all kinds of things. So we've seen recently uh, quite a bit around uh, gaming, right? So people have designed kind of game-based activities. Um, 
we've seen things that are in line with the science literacy approach. So using certain tools like hypothesis or perusal, um, you fill in the blank, some of these new innovative tools. I'm waiting to see a thousand articles about chat GPT sometime in the near future. Um, those kinds of things are all completely appropriate. Uh, again, we tend to see pieces that focus heavily on undergraduate student populations, lesser so on things like faculty or GTA professional development. Um, although those again are quite welcome. I personally have published things that are more in the realm of faculty and TA professional development in the tips and tools space and in other spaces within the journal. Um, but really, I would say the thing that <clears throat> is perhaps the biggest challenge, if you will, that we see is really a novelty piece. So I just encourage folks when they reach out and they have concerns about why you know the decision may have been unfavorable or requesting kind of major revisions oftentimes the response that we have is a lack of novelty um so it's hard searching and scouring for instance through google scholar or whatnot is incredibly difficult you're never going to find absolutely everything right uh, because people use different terms to describe exactly the same thing right and blame us educators um but do your due diligence that I know I'm preaching to the choir first, but keep in mind that you can put a new spin on something, right? Um, so to chat GPT, for example. So maybe you've done a chat GPT activity. Um, I'm going to try this out. This is why it's coming straight to mind, but have a partner tool like Hypothesis or Perusal, right? Ask chat GPT to generate a bunch of text and then have people collaboratively kind of annotate that text and point out potential flaws or Right? It's not perfect. The AI is not perfect. So you can do things like that, even though the, the like hypothesis has existed now for quite a while, right? Um, those kinds of adaptations are certainly completely appropriate. Um, but yeah, we see a lot of games or a lot of kind of simulation based things, for example. Uh, we occasionally, although quite honestly, um, to a lesser degree, see more lab focused pieces. Uh, my perception is that those tend to go either in the research section or the curriculum section just because of the scope right the scale of that effort um but we'll see you know like here's a new and innovative way to help students think about dilutions or about uh, you know i don't know you fill in the blank right a cool new technique to help them try to understand crispr cas technology so we see all of those types of things um and i know i'm rambling i apologize but i would quite honestly say the bet best advice for me would be to check out the things that are published in the journal. That'll give you a good idea of what's out there. It'll give you a good idea of how to format the paper, um, what kinds of things you want to be sure to include. Um, we only have a short amount of time left, but Sam, maybe you could say something about lab safety and the importance of a lab safety review in some cases. Absolutely. So when our manuscripts come through, there's always a place uh, related to biosafety um, and lab safety. And it's really important to annotate in the manuscript what level of security and safety your lab would require, especially um, if it is a lab activity. If you are talking about safety with your subjects, you would have to clarify that. It's really important as different readers are reading the manuscript to be able to evaluate whether it is um, kind of in place within the scientific literature. And this is something we actually do have people who will review the biosafety a little bit um, differently rather than just the manuscript itself. Thank you very much. Um, Sorry, can I interrupt for a second? A Q&A in there about novelty as it relates to students. And I imagine instructors in poor and underdeveloped countries. Um, so to that point, I would just say novelty, again, doesn't mean brand spanking new or like the end world hunger, Miss America passion kind of approach to this like huge, massive scale undertaking. Uh, but we see, for example, uh, things that come through where the population of students is what kind of makes it novel, right? So I've taken this, it's only ever historically been used for majors and now I'm using it in a non-majors context, or I have this particular tool, it's only ever been used by students, but now we're adding this kind of community engagement lens to it. 
so innovation doesn't necessarily just mean, right, that it's something that was built from scratch. Uh, I think there's, I would argue at least that there's lots of ways to be innovative. Um, and again, if it's a conversation where you feel you are limited based on resource or context or whatnot, please, please, please always reach out to us. And we're happy to bounce ideas around and, and kind of help steer the conversation towards the goals that you have in mind. I think that's a really excellent point, Jeff. And I would add that if you do your due diligence with your literature review, there in your introduction for your manuscripts, whether it's tips and tools or any other space within the journal, you would make your argument for novelty there. Thank you very much. I think those were really good points for us to come to the end on. I want to remind everybody in the audience that we're going to have another Jimby Live on Friday, March 10th. So please join us. Uh, tell your colleagues to join us as well. And it will give us a more robust conversation. So thank you so much. Rachel, would you like to close us out? Cool. Thank you for attending, and the recording of this will be posted to our YouTube playlist probably sometime middle of next week, and we'll have a webinar Friday, March 10th, and then we're going to take a short break, but we'll be back on May 5th and May 19th uh, for really exciting talks by um, papers that just came out in Jimby. So take a look at our website and go register for each of those. Remember, they're all free. And reading Jimby is free of charge, too. So uh, we hope to see you at a future event. Take care, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs>